And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This segment is sponsored by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training certification and research. Visit SANS.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center's CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Visit them on the web at Tenable.com. And by Black Squirrel, pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Good, but for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. Now fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer, and give the intern control of your botnet. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, who has nothing funny to say, except that this is episode 404, and it's not found. Hey, 404! Whoa! It's 404! Yay! So we officially got a 404 on Thursday, January 29th, 2015, when we're recording this episode. I am joined in the studio by only the production staff, which you can't see, but there, yes, there's our lovely production staff. Our production staff, they're awesome, and they're all really good looking, but you can't see them. Sorry. On the lines via Skype, we have two also very fine looking gentlemen. Mr. Joff Thayer is with us. Joff, welcome to the show. Yeah, good day, Paul. Good to be here for this final week of January. Wow, 2015 already going fast. That's it. Mr. Carlos Perez joins us on the lines via Skype from sunny Puerto Rico where there's not 18 feet of snow. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Not even an inch. That's what she said? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> cold weather got you down. Why don't you warm up with Embedded Device Security Assessments, a two-day hosted class at the SANS ICS Summit on February 25th through the 26th. Security Weekly listeners receive a 10% discount when using the code SECWEEK10. You can register and find out more about the course if you go to securityweekly.com forward slash IOT. That's securityweekly.com forward slash IOT will take you to the place where you can have a link. You can register for the upcoming class. In the upcoming class, where's where you can escape all of this horrible weather if you live in the Northeast like I do and learn about embedded device security assessments at the ICS Summit. Larry's teaching SANS 617 wireless ethical hacking in Orlando, Austin, Texas, Baltimore, Maryland, and Berlin, Germany throughout the first half of this year. So make sure you check the show notes or the SANS website for more information. Security Weekly listeners all receive 10% off products in our store, shop.securityweekly.com. Using the code IHACKNAKED, you can be the very proud owner of a Hack Naked t-shirt. We've got black t-shirts. We've got red t-shirts. We've got ladies t-shirts. We've got ladies t-shirts with guys on them. We've got ladies t-shirts with women on them. We've got guys t-shirts with ladies on them. They're in pink. They're in white. They're awesome. You should go to shop.securityweekly.com and wear your hack naked t-shirt proudly. Yes. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and join our Google Group's mailing list and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would say go to wiki.securityweekly.com for more information on how you can follow us. Please do because we post interesting stuff. Now, I'd like to bring back a very special guest for this episode who attempted to have a conversation with me about breaches on episode 400, but... I don't know. We lost control of the show, Mike, is what happened. I blame <laughs> Space Rogue. End of the day. Yeah. Yes, we lost control. Michael Santarcalangelo. Well, is here Cyber War. Don't blame, don't blame him then. Blame, blame the Cyber War. It was Cyber War. Yeah, it was a Cyber War, war launched against my guy. So Michael Santarcalangelo is here with us. Mike, welcome back to the show where Thanks, hopefully man. we can have a more structured <laughs> conversation. If that's what you desire, that's what we will have. Okay. Or maybe unstructured. But we'll control it this time. <laughs> Damn it. Yes. And that's what a warning to Joff and Carlos. Participate, <laughs> you mean I have to behave? <laughs> participate nicely. Um, 
so, Mike, let, let's see. Where do we want to begin? We were talking about five questions an organization should be able to answer in order to avoid a breach. So yep. I kind of want to turn it over to you to kind of set the stage for that and pick up where we left off. Great. Let me, um, let me rewind a bit, too, and, and let me challenge that. Because one of the things that I've studied looking at this is that we always say, oh, that breach should have been avoided. It could have been avoided. It should have been prevented. And then it's always that, why don't we do something? You know, and obviously we got to save the children and stop the terrorists, right? So um, what I've been looking at for the last year or two more in depth is that we have this bias for prevention. We keep thinking that the answer is always prevention, prevention, prevent. I should have prevented it. And so instinctively then everything we do goes towards what should we have done to prevent it? What I'm looking at a little bit differently is that what we need is a different mentality. One that says, in fact, it's, it's permeating more places. It's what's called assume breach. The idea behind it is you assume that you might get breached. Now, let me be clear. I don't mean assume you're always breached, assume all hope is lost, go home, pack up, take your toys with you. It's not going to happen. What it means is that instead of thinking that your defenses are infallible and that you can always prevent it, you just look at it and go, well, what if? What if somebody did get through? And then you open yourself up to a lot of questions uh, as, as we start to take a look at it, which, I mean, that makes sense, right? I mean, your background is breaking through a lot of this type of stuff. You think it's reasonable to assume a different mindset? And, and that's exactly, uh, when we do penetration testing, that's the approach that I recommend. And a lot of people who are defending are of that mindset, well, you know, just break in and tell me how you did it. And I'm like, no, no, no. What about we do this? <laughs> Let's assume that someone's already broken in. Let's start like where your most sensitive assets are and start from there and work out and, and yeah. then approach it like complete opposite as it's been traditionally approached uh, in our industry. And I, I, I like that approach a lot. So it makes people uncomfortable a little at first, but then when you explain it to them, I think, uh, I think they're on board. Well, let's, let's give somebody something to let them off the hook a little bit. One of the things we're fond of saying is gaps, right? We go, oh, we got a gap. We got a gap analysis. We got to bridge the gap. I say it all the time too. Here's the problem. If you're in technology and you're in security, you're very comfortable with those concepts. The minute you go to an executive or worse, you go to the board of directors and you say, well, we got some gaps. What you've signaled, albeit unintentionally, is you didn't do your job. Mm -hmm. You missed it. You should have seen it or whatever else. So here's the thing, folks. There's no gaps. Throw it away. If we need to talk about it as a team, sure, fine. Let's do a gap analysis. But it's not about the gaps. The situation has changed. Again, you, you guys know this far better than me, but our attackers are smart. Our attackers are disciplined. I mean, they went to business school. They understand supply chain. They understand specialization. They're going to get through if they want to. So it's not about having a gap. It's about being able to have a conversation and say, things have changed. And that's okay, right? Because the follow-up to it is instead of saying, there's a gap, which signifies I screwed up and I missed it. You turn around and say, things have, the landscape has changed, but that's okay. We're going we're gonna to react to it. I can handle that in a particular way. But one of the things I've been working on a lot, too, in conjunction with this is what I call the competencies of leadership. Now, if you're not... Uh, and I, I'm not a fan of leadership is, is a position. Leadership to me is, is action. So you can be a leader even if you're not the head of the team. There's nine competencies that I've broken down, but let's focus on three. Your ability to prioritize your assets and your efforts, your ability to measure and demonstrate your wins, and your ability to communicate value to other people. And if you think about this, 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 this is resonating with everybody I work with and everybody I talk to across the industry right now. We're struggling across all of those types of things. Well, if you're trying to prevent everything from bad from ever happening, where do you start? And so the questions that I came up with, and, and I love that. Uh, in fact, you know, thank you. Your question for that on episode 400 gave me a concept. I built it out into a slideshow. Um, nice. You know, I write for CSO. I put it out. It it um it did well. It was in fact, you know what I really liked is a couple of the the folks from the show actually, you know, sent me a note and said, Hey, good, I'm glad you actually wrote that up. So even though we got lost in a little bit yeah, of a yeah. haze, I must have told people I was gonna do it. Uh, and I did. And I followed nice. up with it. What I tried to do then was say, Okay, so if I'm a competent leader and I, I wanna look at this stuff differently, which means I've gotta prioritize. I've got to be able to measure what's going on and I've gotta be able to communicate the value of my actions to somebody else. What are the questions I'd need to ask? Because stopping saying, what, 
How could this have been prevented? No, that's useless. It, it's dumb. Leave that stuff for Congress where hopefully nothing gets done. Let's go talk about real questions. So that's, I kind of looked at some different questions. You want to you go through them? Or sure, think? yeah, absolutely. First question, and then I've, got, of course, got sub-questions because that's, that's fun. And I sent a copy of this in, so if, if you guys want, you, you're welcome to post this up on the wiki. Sure, absolutely. First of which is, what is your mindset? What's your approach? Um, and here's why I ask it that way. Over the last year or so, I had the chance to do a couple educational series with some vendors looking at this and bringing these types of concepts forward. So we'd say to somebody, do you assume breach? Oh, hands go up. Yeah, yeah. 75% of people that I surveyed over the last year totally assume breach. The minute you follow up, then say, well, what'd you do about it? Crickets. Mm. Well, so it, what, it, what it showed me was, okay, we, we're, we're getting it mentally. All right, I can't, I can't stop it all. Did you change your budget? No. Did you change your tool set? No. Did you change your processes? No. Right? Uh, uh, Anton Chivakin over at uh, Gartner uh, had a note, I think it was early part of last year, said, you know, the average company, 10% of their budget is spent on everything other than prevention. So your detection, your response, everything else, 10% or less. I went out to a bunch of people and said, is that true? And they laughed and they went 10%. <laughs> I'd kill for 10%. So our budgets are biased. Our actions are biased. And, and so, the, so the, the caveat is if we say, oh, yeah, I, I assume breach. I totally get it. Yep. The, the natural follow-up question is to say, okay, well, what have you done about it? What Have you gone in? I mean, look, Paul, if somebody is going to engage you, the question they should ask then is to say, hey, Paul, tell me if you see evidence that something happened. Don't just, right to your point, don't just tell me you got in. When, when you're getting, did you see evidence? Did you step over something that was there already? Is there something I should be concerned about? Because that's what you that's what you want to know. And How even, often do you see that? Even the, well, even the flip side to that, Mike, is when I was breaking into the systems. Did you see me? Right, and that's that's one of the really values simple question too. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Mike, I want to get back to the point you made about um, people should know where their most important assets are. That that's yes. hard. That's hard, right? You ask it, people that, and even if they say they know, sometimes after you do a pen test, maybe they really didn't know where all their most important assets are. And in today's world you're, of technology, you're being generous. of cloud, mobile, virtualization, it, it's, it feels like it's next to impossible to know where my, my assets or my critical data is residing. Hey, hey Paul, could I, could I interject before you go there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so something that just occurred to me as, as you guys were having that interchange is one of the challenges in the information security community, I think, with what uh, Michael just presented is is kind of emitting failure, right? I mean, what what we have here is um, the, the the defend, defend, defend mindset. You know, is built upon the idea that we we actually might succeed doing so, and we, we we've come into a situation today with a with a threat environment that we just cannot succeed. And so, the I think the hardest part to overcome uh, in turning that conversation around, especially with the exec level, is to say. Essentially, you know, we've we really been doing it wrong. We're going to assume that failure to some degree, that may be a little strong, and then change the conversation based on that. And I just want, wanted to make that well, point because I think that's where it's hard for people to break through and get that conversation started. I'm so glad you brought that up because th that's, that's exactly what I guess I was dancing around before to say stop saying there's a gap. You know, I, I think it's easy to say, yep, that doesn't work. Yeah, everything we've done for 20 years is wrong. And it's, it, what's interesting is I have said that. And you watch some folks that have been doing this for 20, 30 years. Uh, they, they don't appreciate being told to their faces that their life's work sucked and, and exactly. they didn't get it done. But so what I learned from it, though, was that but things did change. And so, you know, we, we happen to be a somewhat pessimistic industry. And, uh, and that's tragic. I mean, those of you who weight train or lift weights or do sports, right, you cannot train a bad diet. Look at the steady stream of crap we're putting in our heads. It's always negative. We can't do this. This is bad. This person screwed up. We're idiots. We can't get ahead of it. So all I'm suggesting is, yes, we need to change, and we need to change our approach. But instead of signaling, yep, we're going to get defeated, I think, I think what we do is we reset success. And, and Paul already said it. Instead of saying, I can prevent everything, say, how quickly can I detect when something goes wrong? I mean, I, that's, to me, that's a, it's a much better measure of it. You know, and by the way, I read another article today uh, lamenting how, you know, executives and breaches get ousted and then they, they cite Target. Guys, Target was about the failed expansion in a Canada that had nothing to do with the breach. That, so we have to be careful too when we hold out, well, so-and-so got fired and so, 
Yeah, there's always a lot of stuff. And I, I've, I've been a proponent for the last year suggesting breaches are awesome cover to do a lot of crap in your company that you've been waiting on. Oh, there's a breach. Well, cool. Fire this guy, fire this guy, fire this yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, You know, it's clean them up. Right. Uh, and to, to go back to your point, Mike, of, um, you know, running under the assumption that you're breached and being able to detect it quicker, I learned that firsthand when I worked for a university because there was no possible way in some areas that right. I could do very much to prevent a, bre a breach. But a breach that I could detect within 24 or 48 hours which was much less damaging to the organization than one that went on for a year or more. And, and I was working to basically just close that gap and just detect them as quickly as possible. That's right. um, and really focusing on that 24 to 48 hour window uh, before I've done so. When you see some of these breaches that have been in the news, um, a lot of times you'll read about how long the system was breached. They did forensics and they're like, oh my God, this system was breached for an entire year. Now we're really screwed. And, That's I, right. and I think that really backs up your point of, it's about detecting as quickly as possible. Yeah, and, well, and that goes back to your priorities, right? So, so here's the other thing then, too. Um, all right, yeah. So we we have to shift and and admit that some of the legacy stuff that we've been doing doesn't carry us forward. Hopefully, and I mean this with all sincerity, we don't think that that means we failed. What it means is we have a new opportunity as we go forward with things. Okay, well, so then what about your priorities? You know, I, a lot of people say, well, just go ask the business. Yeah, here, here's a flash. You know what they know? They don't know either. They're not, they're not working on any different constraints than we are. They're not really sure. So what it does is it creates an opportunity to start, start with that narrative and say, hey, guys, look, things have shifted. Things have changed. We got limited numbers of resources. And what I want to make sure is that we're, we're putting our protections in the right places and that we're detecting the right things. Now, uh, what's important to you? And then just be prepared that when you ask that question, when you ask somebody what their priorities are, they may not know in, in the first pass, so keep the meeting short. And, and then when you come back together again and they've collected some data, just be prepared to ask questions. I love whiteboards for that. Just start drawing it up, start looking at it and saying, okay, so what if somebody touches this right here? What happens? Okay, what if they get in here? Okay, what if? And, and be prepared. A lot of times they start out with this. Uh, that wouldn't be a big deal. You say, okay, so they got into the database and they changed the ship date by two weeks. Not a big deal. And you watch them process it and they go, oh, uh, no, actually, we'd be screwed. You go, okay. So. That's the, scary, that's the scary part for me, Mike, when I consult with people about security. And we tell them to prioritize your assets and go through the uh, exercise you just described of, well, you know, what if this, what if that? And a lot of times, and I'm sure, you know, Joff and Carl's can attest, right? You do a pen test and you get a foothold in something that is seemingly not important. Yeah. But then over time. And I think this kind of comes back to our uh, detection in, in less time uh, scenario. You get a little foothold and then you're just kind of working it from there and just picking upon any little thing that they might have missed or not paid attention to before you do get to the really sensitive stuff. And that's the kind of scary thing for me is I like to tell people, you know, focus on where your, your most critical assets are. But then the issue that I have with that, even from a practitioner standpoint is, well, these little small footholds, you know, an unpatched Adobe Flash player or even a patched one that has a zero day could gain a foothold and be disastrous for your organization. Right. What, what, right. How, do you, how do you deal with that fear, uncertainty, and doubt, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, again, you know, I, I liked your suggestion of when you bring someone in to do a pen test, look to detect them. And, you know, look, we've talked about strategies for years. I, I don't care if I know that you're coming in or not. Like, it, I don't need it to be a double-blind test, and I, mm -hmm. I can't even know. You could signal to me, Michael, I'm coming in right now. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Good enough for me, because either I do. Yeah, I got you. I don't have to stop you. I can just go, right. yep, got it. Okay, I know what to look for or whatnot. Um, here's the thing. Incremental improvement's Okay. Right. I mean, look, as you laid out, if, if you could detect a breach in 48 hours instead of 229 days, mm -hmm. dude, you're, that's improvement. That's improvement. So the question is, how, how, where are you today? Right. Like, what are you measuring? How are you measuring it? What, what tools do you have? What, what data are they giving you? What are you even looking for problems and how, how, how are you doing it? What's the frequency that you're looking for? You know, if you go back, what, we're all old enough. Go back like 20 years. Do you remember when people used to get really excited 
like when intrusion detection first came out and they wanted instant notification. You know the question I'd always ask? Who's it going to? Hmm. And, and do they want instant notification? Well, it's going to go to some dude's pager at 3 o'clock in the morning. And what's he going to do about it? Nothing till 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Then you don't need instant notification. Right. I mean, if the standard today is 229 days, 179 days, a year, whatever, pick a number. Okay. Are you, are you at that? Are you better than that? Are, where are you at? And if you don't know, then yeah, then hire you or, or hire other people. Have them come in. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, I got to make a comment here. I think one of the mismatches that has happened over time is that the, the compliance and regulatory environment has kind of driven the, the appliance vendors to, uh, you know, search out and destroy what is called known bad, in my opinion. And, and known bad is fine, but it's known, right? Right. You, you look at it in the, in the pen test world uh, and, um, you know, in the, in the criminal world, we're not known bad. We're unknown bad. And so in flipping the model over, what we're trying to say to, to our customers, certainly at Black Hills, and I, I think others are trying to do this too, is to say, let's start you know, making that assumption that, that the breach is there, it's going to happen, and, and, and we're after anomalies. We're after unknown things. We're not, we're not looking at all those appliances, right. looking at signatures and so forth. We're, we're looking for unknown bad here. We're looking for unknown weird activity. And, I like and, it. And, that, and that's the thing that is hard for folks to wrap their head around. But if you can deliver some product or, or process or mechanism for success there, that's a much better argument back up. You know what I love? Chain. Awesome segue to question number two. What yep. can I automate? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when you ask about what you can automate, th there's, there's, two, there's two basic things that I look at. The first of which is um, I, I always love that scene in Tommy Boy where he's trying to sell the guy a brake pad and the guy's like, look, I love you, I love your dad, but they got a guarantee on their box. And he's like, I can take a shit in the box, put a guarantee on it. All you got is a guaranteed box of shit. And, and I always loved that because, you know, when you say, I'm going to automate, well, what are you automating? Like when you say, what can I automate? The question isn't, what crappy process do I have that doesn't really work well today that I can automate so I can get more of a crappy process? The question is, what can I automate today, right? So the first thing is, what can I automate that improves my capabilities and reduces my burden. And then the second part to that is across prevention, detection, and response. Uh, and, and the more you can tie things together, the better off that you're going to be. Right? Because ultimately, we don't have enough people, uh, and, and we never will. I mean, as an aside, I, I always bristle when somebody tells me that there's not enough people, and there's not enough technology, and there's not enough. You know, the guys, look, it, it's a problem that other people have solved. We'll solve it too. The question is, what are we looking for, right, Joff, as you just laid out? And, and how are we looking for it? How is it presenting to us? Um, you know, one of the mistakes I see a lot of people do right now when it comes to detection is they just look for alerts. And, and they look for like single source alerts. Now, there are times when a single alert is enough to say, well, this is, this is problematic, go. Um, but uh, some of the companies that I've talked to, they're spending 80% of their time on, on false positives. They have a team of seven or eight people spending their full time. They're wasting $520,000, $100,000 a year chasing down false positives. Uh, that's not good. That doesn't, that doesn't solve our problem. So the question then is, right, and I hate the, the term smart automation, but like, are you automating stuff in a way that makes it better for your team? And, and are you getting to that detection point quicker? Yes? Good job. No? Cool. Got something to work on. Mike, does a, a lot of it, uh, the solution to some of the problems you outlined, um, does that, I think it really stems from building relationships between security and the other groups within your organization that can be an extension to your team. The organizations that I've seen struggle with security, I think one of the commonalities that they have is IT security is acting inside of a bubble or a silo. And they're like, we don't have the resources. We can't, we can't do anything. We can't make things more secure. The organizations that do it well have bred security into the culture of their developers and systems administrators and desktop management teams. And they're doing the bidding of security. Now, albeit their number one goal is uptime, but if you can tie the two together, get them on board with security, make them an extension of the security team, those organizations I found are, are a lot more effective. So what are some tips you have for people to be able to bridge that gap if you buy into my theory that security is about culture in that aspect? I, I buy into your theory 100%. And one of the things I remember is uh, I've spoken at a couple conferences where 
the people who come up to talk to me aren't the security people. Yeah. It's the data guy. It's the architect. It's the whatever. And and it, what's always interesting is they always say, "Man, I loved your approach because I I focus on communication and taking friction out of our communication and building those bridges." But then they always say, "You know, I don't understand why you security guys don't trust me. I, I don't understand why you know I'm already uh, uh, aggregating all of this data." And all you want me to do is add a field to it. I'm on it, bro. I got it. And I'll give you access to it. Mm. And, you know, so what's interesting about it is it goes, I think it goes back to prioritizing, right? Not the assets, it prioritizing our assets and our efforts. Yes. There are things that we can do that are really well suited for us based on our experience level, based on our knowledge, based on whatever it takes. And frankly, I think the thing to it then is, is we have to stop feeling like it's us. It's, it's all on us. Only I can do it. Yeah, no, um, other people can. I mean, if what you're trying to do is just grab information or, or whatever, there are people in your organization whose job is to do something very comparable to yours. There is as good as you, if not better. And frankly, who, who's not interested in security today? Teach them. Hmm. Work with them. And so to your point, they'll do your bidding, but more importantly, they'll do their bidding and, and they'll overlap. enhance the security. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a, so the, where I see the overlap, right, because I spend a lot of time in vulnerability management, um, the, uh, the goal of both security and systems administrators, for any, and that's just one group, right? The, the goal there is to have most of your systems patched, if not all. But, I mean, to have them all patched at any given time is next to impossible. But have, share some common goals in patching. Share some common goals in configuration management. Is, are the systems configured securely? And those are two things that are both common goals of sysadmins and security folks. And you have to work together to achieve that. And I think that instead of working together, there's been a lot of friction between those two groups. And it's time to kind of break down some of those barriers and work together towards a common goal. Now, anytime you work together towards a common goal with another group, you're both going to have to make some sacrifices but do that intelligently. Say, well, not 100% of my systems are all going to have the same configuration all the time. What's the acceptable level of variance? Where should we focus our efforts? Which systems need to go for, you know, need to have this first and which systems can wait kind of thing and make sure that there's a uniform process. And I, I'm, I'm not trying to make it sound easy. That's extremely difficult. Um, but you're only going to accomplish those difficult tasks if you work together. Yeah, well, I mean, how often do you, in your work, do you come across somebody who doesn't have the word security in their title, but they could teach you a couple of things? I mean, oh, they've, they've lived it. Yeah. Right, okay. So so the thing that we have to recognize then is that we have security in our title, but some of us that have been doing it, I've, I've been in this since 1997. Uh, I think there was one book on security when I got started. Mm -hmm. There was like one conference. If you did security, it was just because you were just curious enough to see. Uh, I mean, there's you you you're surrounded with people that are uh, smarter than me that are, that have cooler, better stories. My whole way of getting the security was really simple. I asked a partner on a project why our pricing spreadsheet was available to the client. Boom! I had a weekend to fix it. Mm -hmm. I'm a security guy. It was really simple like that. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are smart that have solved problems, and so I guess it's a part of that mind shift that mind shift that says. I am around other people that are smart, that are trying to get their job done, you know, and maybe there's compromises. You know, I, I, let me hold out a, a difference. Maybe there's not. Mm. I mean, as you've already indicated, I don't think it's realistic. All systems can be all, all patched all the time. So what's the realistic time that your system can be exposed or should be? And, and by the way, does everybody agree? Because if the people right. responsible for it don't agree with you, then maybe you're just being arrogant. And, and the right answer is whatever makes sense for the company. So I think that if, if we can start looking at that a little bit to say, okay, we're a team. I have this knowledge and these are the things I can do. And then, I, look, I'm always happy to say to somebody, what can I do? What can I, how can I help you? What, what is it that you need from me? And if they say, dude, back off. Got it. <laughs> right. I'm on it. <laughs> you know. And, then, and that's, where we can, that's where the detection comes in. That's where the monitoring comes in. Absolutely. If they've agreed to something and they don't do it, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't go pound on their desk and, and try to get into a fight. I just go, all right, what's up? What, what do we need to do? Take a look at it. That leads us to our third question. How much confidence do I have in my people, in my process, in my technology? All right? it's, it's a confidence issue. Mm -hmm. um, if we're going to, and let's be fair, we, we have a prevention bias, whether we're willing to admit it or not, we're going to have it for a little while. Um, and, and I don't, I'm not suggesting at any level we throw prevention away. Here's the question. How effective is it? How do you know? How are you testing? Do you have a scorecard? Do you have a report card? In fact, look, I, it's, it's very similar to speaking. 
a lot of people will come to me after they do a keynote and they go, what'd you think? And uh, my question to them is always, A, what kind of feedback do you want from me? But here's the really simple question. What was your goal? Yeah. I mean, when, when you went to talk to somebody, at the mm -hmm. end of that, what, what were they supposed to think? What were they supposed to do? What were you expecting from them? And that will help me understand how to evaluate how you did. Well, go back to prevention. Why did you put that tool in? Oh, it's been there since 2001. You weren't the person who purchased it. You're not really sure what it does, but you're afraid to pull the plug on it. All right, I appreciate that. But if you don't know what it does, then how do you know if it's doing you any good? Yeah. What does what, it cost what to goals? maintain? What are the right. goals for that particular solution? That's that's really good. That kind of it makes me think about something I can't really talk about right now, but <laughs> it's along those lines of setting setting goals for the various pieces and processes and technologies that you have and measuring them and reporting on them. It, look, uh, look, I'm just, I'm going to go back to it again, and um, you know, I, I'll happily share these with you and anybody who asks. I'm actually in the process of building it out a little bit tighter. Uh, since Thanksgiving, I've been really working on what I call the nine competencies of IT leadership. Not, mm -hmm. not, not platitudes and bumper stickers and things that make you feel good, but measurable, discernible skills that we need to be highly effective in our positions. And, and on that is the ability to prioritize and measure. And part of that then says, okay, what's the value of this? I have a tool in my network. It's either taking up power, rack space, your attention, or it's costing money because you're paying a fee for it. What are you getting in return? And, I, you know, I, I've been on the fence for a couple of years where I've always said, well, you know, security, yeah, if you want to tell me it's a cost center, I accept that. And, and the best you can do is break even. No, I don't agree anymore. I think security shifted enough. I think our technology shifted. Our, our abilities have shifted enough. If you have something that's giving you even value, maybe you don't get rid of it. But really, if you put something in that's not increasing your capabilities, you need to reconsider that in a big way. Like I, I'm not sure the value that it's providing to you. Here's the other thing too, in your confidence. Let, let's say you're good at detection. By the way, most people when I ask them tell me with uh, absolute confidence they're good at detection. Uh, I would, uh, I'll start introducing them to you and <laughs> maybe we'll find out. But what's your response? And, uh, and look, I'm not knocking anybody who does response, but if your answer is, well, I mean, I, I remove viruses all day good, then you're very good at something that you should have passed off to desktop support. Yeah. My question to you is, how good are you at response? Like when this is something, as Joff said, it's the unknown. It's not the known bad that's already on our network that we kind of got an idea on. This is something that you got to go track down and figure out. Who is it uh, that you can count on? How well trained are they? And are they able to put their focus on that? Or, or are they so matrixed and so saddled that, um, yeah, good luck with that. Are, are we using response to continually improve our de own detection and response capabilities? In other words, I'm always responding to the latest threat. Yep. And I'm like, well, I need to go fix that based on the, the breach that just happened. And then you go fix that. And then you introduce some new problem. And they're like, well, that got breached. So I need to do this. You know, is it just constantly a cat and mouse game? Uh, I mean, are you ever really getting ahead or... And, I, and, and so therein comes back to the reason we need to start measuring stuff. Because otherwise, right, and Joff already pointed this out, we can turn around and go, man, I'm failing all the time. I'm just, stuff's missing all the time. You know what I loved? I always love telling people, it, you know, there's, there's a rehearsal. If you've ever done theater or other things where you have to rehearse, why do you rehearse? So you can screw up. So you can learn how to be better. So the question isn't, are we getting ahead or not? The question is, it's that age old difference between are you getting one year of experience five times or are you getting five years of experience? Are you learning from those in, in situations? So every time you have some sort of response, I, you know, I, I love threes and fives. Um, if you study marketing, you study communication, you study learning, threes and fives work. It, threes and fives are also enough to give you a trend. If you've solved the same problem three to five times and you're still the person responsible for it, I, I hold out that uh, unless your circumstances are really unusual, uh, you're holding on too tight. Y you need to document that, train somebody else, shift it off mm -hmm. so that you're prepared for those other things. And then the question is, you know, are you going to the trainings? Are you, are you following your podcast? Are you engaging with your colleagues? Are you going to the conference? Are you learning about the stuff you don't know about yet? And are your techniques improving so that you can not only detect these things quicker, but you're going to respond more accurately? Because really, here's what it's going to come down to. Preventing a breach is is uh, is noble, and the, I'm not again. I'm not saying you don't do it, but what I'm saying is when you get, when your prevention is set up, it's you're going to be judged ultimately on your ability to detect 
quickly and respond appropriately. And and that that answers your question. So it's so to me, you know, it's um, I've written about this before. I, I don't see security as a winning losing game. Um, and I know we always like to go to the sports analogies and everything else. Um, there's a thing called um, an infinite game that says the game is always played. And, and maybe the rules are the same and maybe the rules change. But here's the neat thing that happens from a mindset. If you know the game is always going to be played, are you worried about winning or at all costs or you know not losing at all costs? Or are you more interested in teaching other people how to play the game? And, and so the answer to your question is almost like a Zen cone. Um, th- the way to get better is to get other people involved in the things that you can make fundamental or the things that you can make rudimentary so that you're freed up to go focus on the higher profile stuff. Uh, one more thought on that. When we look at our teams that are running you know, 100% capacity, we're like, yeah, we're totally maximizing them. What happens if you run an Ethernet network at 100% capacity? It dies. <laughs> it's done, right? People are the same way. We need some slack. We need some downtime. We need time to process. We need time to learn. We need time to figure things out. So if we're all excited, you know, and I get it, the adrenaline's addictive. Oh, I'm always on the gun. Oh, it's, uh, I, here's a test. I like to ask people, what are, you, what are your top three priorities for the year? I'll, I'll accept five, right? I like threes and fives. Common answer I get is, oh, Michael, I, I got like 20. Fail. You're not going to, you can't possibly mm-hmm. do 20 things well. I mean, I'm not saying you're not responsible for 20 things. What I'm asking is what are your top three priorities? Well, that extends to your response. What are the, what are the things you need to respond to? Or are you just spinning your wheels? Because that's not, it feels good. I mean, I got 400 emails. I, I, I cleared a thousand incidents. Great. How many of them mattered? Well, that, that also comes that also comes full circle, Michael. Back to you know what you're saying is, so you know prevention in the realm of known bad is something you should automate as much as possible, move off to other people, and get your really critical assets in any organization. The really, you know, high flyers, really bright people, focused on that unknown bad space, focused on that right. high high level analysis space where you can be very very effective. And, and that's, that's the culture change, right? That's, that's I, I completely really agree. Happens. And so then here's, so let's spin it too then to the benefit. Your job is to go look for the anomalies. Your job is to go look for the things that aren't working right. So think of it as a system. Your job is to look for places where the system can break down, where it has broken down, where there's friction points. So that means now you can be an ally to the business and come back to them and say, hey, guys, help me understand again how this works. And this is something I've done successfully for, for years. You get somebody to draw it up on the board and they go, well, that's just a hot mess. He said, okay, <laughs> what would you like it to look like? And they go, I, I, and I'm not saying this thing gets solved in 30 minutes, but what I'm saying is all of a sudden they start looking at it. Well, now if you're involved, you can say, all right, well, so which are these points that you're really worried about? It's the difference between going to somebody and saying, well, what kind of, what kind of authentication would you like? And they look at you dumbfounded and go, well, uh, none. Is that an option? The minute you talk to them about what they're actually doing, what the value is, how they're using it, how somebody else might use it. And then you can circle back and say, okay, what are the things you really want me to pay attention to? Well, well, A, you get better, but you just helped the business. You almost invariably streamlined it. And then it, what I love about it is uh, you get to go in and go, all right, so I came in. I really appreciate the meeting, guys. Um, and, and I feel like we're doing a better job of protecting you. So, uh, all right, hit me with it. So how much more of a pain in the ass is this now? Like one of the analogies that uh, I've heard more recently um, is hygiene. The security is about having good hygiene, like washing your hands, that kind of thing. Yeah. Are, are there other parallels there that, that well, I think make so. any sense? Or I think so. You know, one of the things I've liked for years is, is uh, equating it to wellness, um, not healthcare in in specific. Um, you know, the, the the risk anytime we use these analogies or metaphors is that we get lost in the metaphor. Yeah. It's kind of like suggesting, you know, security is like brakes on a car. No, mm. no, oh, oh, it's not. Yeah. Security is like a house, huh? No. And Marcus uh, Random uh, does that too. Security is like that conversation you have with your doctor, and he tells you you're going to have a heart attack. No, no, that's not. It's not what we're talking right. about. I don't buy into but, that one either. Are there things there like about hygiene, like there's there's basic practices? Sure, yeah. Like every day you wash your hands. So you're you supposed to, to wash your hands every day. Okay. Yeah. Let me write some of these things down. What else should I be doing? 
brushing your teeth? <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't. you don't brush your teeth. No, There's a really good one that a listener sent in. I'm trying. I'm trying to get it. Bring my email up. Uh, but a listener sent us a really funny story, and I was going to segue, but technology's not cooperating with me today. Well, as, as we built into that, here, here's the question I always like to, to look at. I, I think that one of the signs that we can use that we're doing a good job is that when we go and work with somebody, they feel more protected. They feel that we have a better understanding of what they're trying to do. Not, we're not trying to inflict our will. And then at the end, when you go, okay, cool, so what kind of impact was I on you? They go, I, I actually... Um, none like this was good like i'm we're better because of you you get to that you've definitely done it right oh right. so dave dave writes in and he said i think it was paul that made a comment about taking coffee cups into the restrooms and i, I did i was talking about people take their coffee cups and leave them next to the sink and people are washing their hands and it's splashing into the coffee cup um he said when when he was on uh campus it was a busy campus and none of the classes were all over the place so they had to go grab something to eat from one of the small, numerous lunch stations. And normally you grab something to eat quickly. Um, and he said, one day I was at the restroom at a mealtime and in walks this guy with a plate, which had a sandwich and some other <laughs> stuff on it, all unwrapped, of course. He took it up to the urinal and placed, it, <laughs> placed the plate between his feet. Splish, oh. splash, my sandwich was taking a bath. <laughs> Ew. Ew. <laughs> I don't know if there's parallels in the... The information uh-huh. security about that, but I, I thought that was a really funny story. You know, I'm sure there are. Are you okay if we don't probe that one too much deeper? Yeah, no. I. You know what? We can leave it. We can leave it just at that. I mean, well, it's a this, hell this of a story. one is when security actually messes up business. That's yeah. a good example. I think They're that guy at the general, for- I think he worked for, works for Sony now. Or at least... <laughs> <laughs> is it too soon? <laughs> Not for me, but I'm not good with those timings. I, I, I don't think it's too soon. I think it's about right. <laughs> All right, here's the fourth question, and actually, I, I I'm going to defer to you on it. Let me just set it up. What can I learn from testing? Uh, and, and here's what I mean by that. And you already laid it out right at the top of our conversation. So many times we look at testing. Um, for a long time, it was the anvil, right? Or it was the hammer, I guess. It was, oh, I brought these guys in, man. They, they kicked our asses in like 10 seconds. Like, we're screwed. Like, uh, I, I need more budget. I need more yeah. people. I need this technology, right? And, and now it's kind of become that, and, and Joff has brought this up already. I mean, it's that, I'm good. Look, I brought in these pen testers. You know, it, it took them forever to get there. I mean, we're good. Like, look, look at me. All right, so how do we flip that around? I mean, I, I think the, que- the operative question to ask is, what can I learn from my testing? Because I, look, I would rather hire you. You're under contract. I trust you. You're going to come in. You're going to tell me w- what I need to know. I may not want to hear it. I'm guessing you deal with that a bit. Mm-hmm. So what can I learn? What are the what are the things I should be asking you when you come in and test me, uh, right? And Joff, I know you've got experience here. Carlos, I don't know you as well yet. Well, when, when you guys engage in these types of things, what are the missed opportunities? What are the things I should be asking you? Well, so I can I, learn. well, I kind of think of three levels of testing to kind of set the stage for that first. So first, uh, it, you know, to kind of relate it a little bit to hygiene is the first level is to test yourself, right? And this stems from learning from incidents that happen internally that maybe have absolutely nothing to do with security, but something went wrong. And typically the processes that identify those problems and fix those problems, if you get good at those, you also get good at security. Hey, our DNS server went down. Oh, someone changed the configuration file. Well, how do we prevent that in the future? How do we test for that? Uh, So internal testing. Then I would say the next level of internal testing is internal security testing. So having some kind of vulnerability management program, having something like the the monkey thing that Netflix has, right, which goes and breaks things and tests things internally and having a process that fixes those and learning when something is found to be vulnerable or something uh, gets broken that you fix it. And then the third component from that is like we were talking about, Mike, is you come in from the outside um, and you're actually the one uh, doing the testing, helping out the organization and finding what maybe they have missed in their own forms of testing. So I would say, it's not answer to your question exactly, but one of the things that an exercise I like to, to go with is the question I ask the people who are giving the test to is, well, what are some of your internal processes and procedures for 
fixing vulnerabilities, for systems administration. And they go, uh, I don't have any of those processes. Okay, maybe you're not ready <laughs> for that external okay. test yet. Let's fix that problem first and then talk about the external test. How much do I need to know? All right, I'm a, I'm a three-man shop. Um, I'm supporting a company. I don't care whether you think that's appropriate or not because everybody's got an opinion on that. All right, now you're telling me I got to do internal testing. Do I need, should I go take a training course? Do I need to buy a tool? Are the tools good enough now they can walk me through it? Like, how do I get to that first level? What do I need to know? I would say that your first step is to have those conversations with your management and internal teams and, and figure out what's, what's capable. What, you know, what can we do internally? How do we, how do we mm. manage patches? How do we manage configuration? Do we do it at all? What kind of systems do we have? What kinds of configurations do we have? Are we virtual or are we cloud? What's our strategy there? Once you have that level of information about the business, how the business runs, how the IT shop operates, then start picking off your low-hanging fruit. What do you want to implement first? You know, maybe it's maybe it's patch management, maybe it's endpoint protection, maybe it's vulnerability management. Who knows? But you're not going to know that until you have those conversations to kind of figure out where you're at in the maturity of your IT. You know, maybe your IT yeah. department comes to you and says, "Well." We've got this cloud instance. We can build systems on the fly. We can pre-build software into these images and take images and servers down on the fly. That's a completely different conversation from the IT department that goes, patch management, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, it, it varies a lot. Let me go over my Windows NT machine. Yeah, exactly. What was that, Carlos? Yeah, yeah. Th there was another... Um, hold on, hold on, wait, Carlos. Oh, yeah, Carlos, Carlos, go ahead and make your comment. Okay. Uh, I would say very, as, as Paul mentioned, it varies a lot from environment to environment. I have seen shops where... Uh, the IT people were motivated, they wanted to learn, um, they actually invested out of their own pocket, ter let's say 10% wow. of their salary or 5% of their salary into buying books and being good at what they're doing. And they go, okay, uh, so how did you get in? Cool. What would be your worst nightmare? What did you did that uh, we could have caught easily? And then they do miracles with what they have. They add scripting, they add uh, notifications to what uh, uh, if this event log happens. Okay, I have a script that will check every minute and will send me an email if I get this. It will do the alerting because I, I know how my system works. I know what I have and take it at time. And as Paul mentioned, there are other times where the organization, the teams are just going through the numbers. Okay, click here, click here, next, next. Okay, I'm done. It's five. Let me go back home. And they don't have that motivation. So investing that time of actually having those pre-engagements of going in, having meetings with them, trying to get a feel for the customer itself actually pays a lot in, in the end when you're writing that report. You know how to kind of custom that report to your customer uh, in a useful way. I've seen many pen test reports where they just hand off a PDF and that's all they do. And... They never do an after action. They never talk with the customer. They never go through the steps. They never go like, this is where you were supposed to catch me. Uh, this is mm. uh, what I left behind. In, uh, they, they go, this is the locker principle. If I touch anything in your environment, I'm going to leave a trace. These are my traces. And on the other end, you might have pen testers who don't even know about that. They go like, I don't know. I just ran this tool and mm. did all of this stuff and it gave me this. <laughs> But did it, did, do you know if it left something in development? Look, I don't know. I'm a pen tester. And that's what I call a tool monkey. They only know how to click on tools and get stuff done. So one of the things I was going to say, uh, maybe a little bit of a segue, but I, but I want to put it out there. One of the things I struggle with with the penetration testing industry, and, and I certainly do my fair share of testing, is that we tend to... Um, have a phenomenal amount of success when we find that first vulnerability, right? Um, it's that, that first foothold that gets us um, a long way. And oftentimes in a penetration test, um, very little vulnerability exploitation is done after that first step, mm -hmm. right? After that, it's all pivoting, expansion. It's all sort of standard systems administration kind of stuff, to be honest. Um, so... You know, having said that, one of the big challenges I think for the penetration testing industry to to show value is is to um, try to continue to think comprehensive uh, in a comprehensive manner after that first 
uh, after that first compromise of of that first vulnerability to get you get you that foothold. Um, and, and that's that's a real challenge. That's the other value challenge uh, on top of what Carlos was saying and having that that post test analysis kind of phase. Um, that that's a really 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 big challenge. And 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 from the perspective of showing your customer not only value but also not leading them down a path where where they're reacting to one very narrowly focused vulnerability or um, or issue when they probably have more things going on in their environment. You know what and I, what and, I love? and many times it's just that deep knowledge and how yep. your stuff works. Because as you mentioned, Joff, many times what we're actually leveraging are their own tools, mm. their own environment, their own credentials, and they don't even know how to kind of look at their stuff and know what is an anomaly. Like, for example, if you have process monitoring all of your boxes, your users typically don't run IP config or NetSH or any of those tools yep. in your environment. Right. If all of a sudden you're getting a bunch of logs that says, hey, NetSH was run in 20 boxes by user so and so, somebody, it's, mm -hmm. something's weird. Something's and probably going able, on. <laughs> you should be able to tell from those anomalies. And many people actually do not have deep knowledge of what's happening on their environment. And if, even on the simplest level, what applications do I have installed in my environment so I can do proper patch management? Yeah. I, yeah. You know, look, I, uh, this is what I love. I, I'm taken by a couple of things that I just kind of want to recap. Um, Paul, I, I like the idea of uh, being able to say to somebody, what do you do today? T talk to me. You know what? I don't think you're ready for me yet. Um, I think that's really powerful if you're on that provider side. I think that's really important then if you're on that vendor, if you're on the enterprise side, the company side where you're asking people those questions, the person who's willing to say, I don't think you're ready for me yet, is probably somebody who's qualified eventually to, to be able to work with you. I like um, I like a lot of what Carlos brought up in, in, in terms of the, this is where you should have caught me. I mean, think about that, right? I mean, like that, what that gave me was two questions. The first question is, as a as the person who hires you, I should be able to say, hey, guys, one of the things I'd really like to know when you go through it is where you think I should have caught you because I'm looking to improve, right? So, that, so Jeff, we've talked already about mindset. That's the mindset change. Where can you guys help me improve? Yeah, yeah, we'll go, we'll go paint the report to everybody else and tell them why I need more money and how I'm really awesome. But in the short run, what, what should I have, should have seen? And you've even given some great examples of those, Carlos. And then, Jeff, I even like the idea, I mean, I'm, I'm a proponent of value. I, I think value is an imperative. And so when you look at it from a perspective of how can we give our clients more value, you know, let me flip that around then and say, so as a client, we should be saying, how am I going to get value from you? You, to, you know, to, to, to all of your points, you don't, you don't want a box monkey who's just going to come in and run a script and be like, all right, well, here's a report. Have a nice day, everybody. Um, you, you want to work with somebody who's going to be able to say, okay, here's some things I saw, but keep in mind, when I did X, that led me to Y, Z, A, and C. And, and so, what, you know, so when we say, what can I learn from testing? What I just learned from you guys is it's equally important on the other side to say, here's what I can teach you from testing. I'm going to give you a report, but if you're open to it, I can help you improve your capabilities. And again, as I don't think it's adding a lot to it. You guys are making notes of this stuff as you go through it. You, you were already listing off awesome examples. So like when we look at the questions we can ask before a breach, these are the things I can ask internally, but they're also the things I can ask you guys. And But they're the, they're the things in that you can pro-offer. They're great because they differentiate you, but that's those are some of the ways that we start to help ourselves, right? Absolutely. Mike, yeah, the, the, I, I and, the, and the funny, the, the funny thing, the irony of all that is, um, if we get better at what we do with our customers in in that kind of way, it makes our job really, really more difficult. Because we we have at Black Hills, we have customers that right. come back, which yeah. is awesome. But after we go through that process with them and we teach them a few things, it's our next tough. time around <laughs> is a huge challenge. Absolutely, that's uh, fantastic. But that's that's a win, and what I've actually tried to convince the um, the other guys in the company that are perhaps newer to the game is like, guys, don't sweat it. That's a huge, huge positive if we've we've achieved right. that. So you know that's an that's an important take home. It's an important lesson, and and it's great for our customers and, and the industry as a whole if that happens. Guys, I, I hate to cut you short, but uh, we're running short on time. 
So I want to thank Mike. Mike, you're more than welcome to stick around for the next segment. Uh, yeah, man. Time. Excellent. I'm so in. we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back and talk about the stories for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 